In the Diablo 4 beta, we were able to thoroughly explore the Fractured Peaks, which while decently large on its own and offering plenty to explore and do, is merely one of six announced total zones that will be playable in the game. So in today's video, I'd like to dive into what we can actually expect from the other five zones of the massive world with information pieced together from official announcements, the betas, and even established Diablo lore. And so with that being said, as a disclaimer before we begin, this video will indeed contain story spoilers from Act 1 of the game, as well as my personal predictions of what will happen in the subsequent acts of Diablo 4's main storyline, and how they tie into and take place in each of these yet unexplored areas of the game. So with that, starting off with a little bit of background, the Diablo games are set in the world of Sanctuary, originally intended to be a safe haven for renegade angels and demons who sought to escape from the eternal conflict created by none other than the respective leaders of those factions, the demoness and daughter of hatred Lilith, as well as her ex-lover, the archangel Inarius. Well, by now, we're well aware of how that turned out, also making Sanctuary ironically very much not a sanctuary, at least for most of its current inhabitants. Anyhow, whereas we have visited many smaller corners of Sanctuary throughout the previous Diablo games, Diablo 4's massive open world features five fully explorable zones on the northern part of Sanctuary's eastern continent, Estuar, with yet one more sixth zone in the game, which is not technically on Sanctuary, but that we'll also be able to go to. And in the open beta, we were able to, alongside Act 1 of the main story campaign, nearly fully experience one of these zones, the Fractured Peaks, which is a harsh, mountainous, snowy area home to familiar demons like the Fallen and the Kazra or Goatmen, as well as new enemy types like vampires and even one of Diablo 4's world bosses, Ashava the Pestilent. The Cathedral of Light led by Inarius also has a strong presence in this zone, with the Father of Sanctuary himself currently residing here in the Alabaster Monastery. But some of the inhabitants of the Fractured Peaks have nonetheless fallen prey to Lilith's influence, with villagers even taking part in sinister cannibalistic rituals in her name. And getting into more spoiler territory, you have been warned if you haven't yet played the Diablo 4 beta, Act 1 concludes with the Daughter of Hatred obtaining the key to hell from her and Inarius' first Nephilim son, the first necromancer in ancient, Rathma, and vowing to avenge him and adding further stakes and fuel to the war between hers and Inarius' faction. And we also learn that Elias, the pale man featured in Diablo 4's opening cinematic and an apparent devout servant of Lilith, has gone to the dry steps which is another zone, pursued by Lorth Nar, one of the last remaining Horadra members, who also gives us the starting quest to meet up with him for Act 3. And right before that, Lorth also makes mention of another mysterious Horadra called Donan, residing in the Skoslen zone, and leaves us another quest to seek him out for Act 2. And thus Diablo 4 does follow more of a non-linear campaign design, not strictly restricting players to finish all the acts in one specific sequence, though the other zones and acts outside of the Fracture Peaks and Act 1 were obviously not accessible during the beta. With that, moving on to our first yet unexplored zone, we've got Skosglen, the highly forested ancestral home of the Druids, which is located on the far northeastern area bordering the coast of the continent of Estuar and is directly north of the Fracture Peaks. Going by Blizzard's official written preview of the zone, the untamed lands of Skoslen are as verdant as they are deadly. Those who get lost in the woods seldom return, their screams muted by spine-chilling howls. The druids who dwell here will do anything to protect their way of life, including risking the loss of their humanity to unleash the beast within. Now speaking of druids, the druids class mechanic which wasn't actually accessible during the beta can then be unlocked in this zone by journeying to the Druid College Terdura to bond with four and then eventually five spirit animals by providing them offerings. And it is also in this great Druid College that stands Glor and Fida, the most revered source of guidance and knowledge for the Druids. 
By the way, I also think it's interesting how there are several other trees of interest in worship in the Diablo series, such as the Tree of Enephus in Diablo 2 and Diablo Immortal, by the way, as well as the Tree of Whispers being a major Diablo 4 feature. And as for Sklosglen's more hellish inhabitants, it's been said that the Khazra or Goatmen roam its wilds, as well as the undead Drowned who rise mysteriously from the misty coastline. Also, very interestingly, in the preview of the upcoming Book of Lorath, Donan, the other remaining Horadrim member, is described to have been given some kind of potion to deal with his grief, which required ingredients found in quote-unquote marsh and swamp, including Iker from the Maggot Queen, who actually bears a very striking resemblance to Duriel, the Lord of Pain. And so if these Swamplands and the Maggot Queen are indeed located in Scotland, Duriol, which is in fact confirmed for Diablo 4, could very well be making a return as the boss of Act 2. After also, by the way, being the Act 2 boss of Diablo 2. Or perhaps he and the Maggot Queen could actually be located elsewhere such as Halazar, which supposedly is quite swampy. However, after doing a bit of detective work, I'm still more inclined to believe that he will in fact be in Act 2, also because in a Diablo 4 quarterly update covering the environment, in one of the videos that Blizzard showcased of one of the dungeons called the Wretched Caves, they explicitly stated that this cave includes ancient druid relics and druidic elements, although they didn't specifically state that this dungeon was in Skosglen, but it more than likely is with, again, its druidic elements, and its environment does very much resemble that of the short Durio clip that we had been shown. And on to the Dry Steps, which is where Act 3 takes place and where Lorth Nar has supposedly gone to pursue Lilith's mysterious underling, the Pale Man Elias. This northwestern area of Estuar seems to be a classic Diablo desert region, but will feature grasslands, canyons, and even salt flats, not all just sand dunes. It is home to corrupted, cannibalistic barbarians, blood mages, and mercenaries. Not too much else has been revealed about the Dry Steps, except for two of the strongholds in the region, the ruins of Kara Yisu, which sounds like a pretty standard cursed town brought about by a demonic pact, initially made to drive out the bloodthirsty cannibals, but at a nonetheless grave cost. However, the other stronghold previewed for this zone is a lot more interesting, the Orbe Monastery, which is a secretive and isolated former prominent base of the Zakarum faith which has also been synonymous with the Church of Light. Not to be confused with Inarius's Cathedral of Light, but nonetheless is an order founded with strong angelic influence by the prophet Akarat, who was said to have been appointed the leader and founder of the Zacharum faith by the archangel Yerius. It is also through the Order of Zacharum that the holy warriors known as Paladins came into being, and I hope we'll be able to see some clues as to whether any Paladins or Crusaders even are still active in the timeline of Diablo 4, which more likely than not, they still are. In fact, in the Orbe Monastery Stronghold preview, it was also mentioned that even though the monastery is dilapidated and abandoned, there is still evidence of quiet worship by Zacharum pilgrims. How intriguing. And on to the next zone, Habazar, the beta has it listed as not being accessible until around level 35, which along with the fact that only the starting quests for Acts 2 and 3 were given out in Act 1, and not for any of the other subsequent Acts, strongly suggests that Havazar is the location of Act 4. It is a swampy zone located directly south of the Fractured Peaks and east of Kedjistan, another zone I will cover shortly. Its major terrain features include dense forests, swamps, marshes, and shallow rivers, perhaps somewhat similar to Karas from Diablo 2, but probably less jungly and more swampy. And to quote Blizzard themselves during one of their presentations, very foul indeed. My initial instinct was whether this is the home of Diablo 3's witch doctors, but it is not, although that western jungle region we might still have a chance to visit in the future. Rather, Habazar is instead home to witches, assassins, thieves, and even giant snakes. I do hope that they'll have something to do with the serpent-like being Tragul, a mysterious deity worshipped by necromancers with intriguing and heavy ties to the world of Sanctuary, Sanctuary's birth, 
and the World Stone, who has already been heavily referenced in Act 1, having been both mentioned in Rathma's scriptures and also prominently depicted on a mural wall of Rathma's inner sanctum in Diablo 4, though the Great Serpent himself has yet to be found, at least as of Act 1. But coming back to Havazar, Blizzard's official description of the zone reads, Poison, disease, and despair spread over this region like mold, growing and infecting everything within. Havazar is a deadly land, even to those familiar with its tortuous and torturous paths, which is in tone long forgotten curses within the swamps, and only those who deal in death or wish to find it willingly come here. I'm particularly interested to see how witches will be depicted in Diablo 4, and with their lore is compelling, perhaps it would also be cool to see one of the classes added down the line to be some kind of witch or warlock as practitioners of demonic magic. In fact, witches already do have some sort of presence in the franchise with prominent characters like Adria and Magda. Next up, onto the fifth zone that will be featured in Diablo 4, and the last so far, actually in Sanctuary, with the sixth being located somewhere more otherworldly, but we'll get to that. But first, we have Kedjistan, which is on the western side of Estuar and a relatively densely populated area, at least until Malthael's massacre during Reaper of Souls. Nowadays, it is apparently a near inhospitable desert wasteland under the control of demonic hordes, cultists, and remnants of the mage clans. Its terrain also seems to be a bit more varied compared to some of the other zones, featuring sand dunes toward the north, but rainforests in the south. It is also where the city of Chaldeum, which we visited in Diablo 3 during Act 2, along with its neighboring areas, is located. This is particularly intriguing as Kedjistan is really the first zone we are revisiting and can actually somewhat compare it to an older version of and observe the aftermath of Malthael's actions as well as the subsequent developments over the past 50 years. So it would be especially cool to see what happened to Chaldeum, which was also under the influence and control of the Lord of Lies, Belial, who presumably possessed or impersonated the child emperor Hakan II during Belial and Asmodan's major infiltrations and eventual invasion of Sanctuary during the events of Diablo III. Emperor Hakan apparently survived the ordeals of Diablo 3 according to the quest texts of certain classes but not all classes in Diablo 3, and recently makes a sort of cameo on one of the few unique items of Diablo 4 that were revealed called the Word of Hakan, featuring the following flavor text. Let the great gates of Chaldeum be sealed. Let its proud wall stand fiercely defended. The rest of Kedjistan may suffer this plague but my city and my people will not. Proclamation of Hakan II. This implies that Chaldea may yet stand, albeit likely desperately trying to survive, and with Hakan being just a child in Diablo 3, he may still even be alive after the 50 or so years that have since passed. Even better, what if, having endured the events of Diablo 3, he actually knows what happened to the protagonist of Diablo 3, the Nephilim? And maybe he even knows something about Tyriel's whereabouts. Otherwise, Blizzard has left very few clues surrounding Kedjistan, with their official written preview stating, Countless wars and demonic invasions have left what was once a bastion of civilization in ruins, though evil still stirs beneath the desert sands. The people who live here used to enjoy opulence and luxuries, now they face fear and paranoia as cultists work in the shadows to unearth ancient evils. Now it is very interesting that there is this mention of ancient evils and the possibility to unearth them. Now this could be a stretch, but I cannot help but wonder about how demons were able to enter sanctuary from hell in the first place, especially given how as told in Act 1 of Diablo 4, both Lilith and Inarius were so insistent on fighting the key to hell from Rathma implying a certain difficulty in at least traversing to that realm and back. Perhaps there is some kind of gate to hell in or around Chaldeum where Belial was the most active. Lilith with her key opening this supposed door or gate to hell in Act 5 would make a lot of sense if it leads to an Act 6 that takes place in hell, which we do know is a zone confirmed for Diablo 4. Also supporting this is Rathma's Prophecy, which is featured very early on in Act 1 of Diablo 4, 
which makes specific mention of tears of blood rain on a desert jewel, and the way to hell was torn asunder, which makes Chaldeum literally described as the jewel of the east, an extremely likely candidate in my opinion for the gateway to hell. And so with that, the likely location of Act 6 is the Burning Hills, or at least a few specific locations within it, as it is supposedly an incomprehensibly vast and deep area divided into eight major territories, with each being ruled by one of the Lords of Hell. Blizzard has said that we will be going there, and a cinematic has also been shown of where Inarius is supposedly leading his army of Pale Knights against Lilith and her forces in Hell, but otherwise, Blizzard has been quite tight-lipped, and probably for good reason so as to avoid spoilers. What we do know so far though, is that Inarius had been trapped in Hell for thousands of years following the Sin War, at the end of which Inarius was offered over to Mephisto in exchange for leaving the mortal realm of Sanctuary out of the eternal conflict. But we all know how that turned out with how hellish and desolate Sanctuary has become. Anyway, another very interesting clue that we do have is that Inarius was somehow freed after thousands of years of being imprisoned and tortured in hell, and that we will likely visit where he was imprisoned, which supposedly is fittingly in the domain of hatred within hell. As for why and how he was freed, supposedly to oppose Lilith, who around the same time was summoned into Sanctuary, will inevitably be a major plot point as well. While we have briefly been to the Burning Hells before, largely in Diablo 2 and Diablo Immortal, and perhaps a tiny bit during Diablo 3 as well, if the areas close to Asmodans even counts, I can't wait to see Hell done in Diablo 4's vision with its more gothic, dark, and even grotesque aesthetic and atmosphere, as well as incredible scale. And with that, that was nearly everything I was able to dig up as well as infer regarding the 5 zones of Diablo 4 that we have yet to explore. I'm personally extremely excited to be able to play through a large, open, loot and lore filled world, which the story will hopefully do justice to. Do let me know in the comment section below what you think, whether you know anything else about these zones or the lore of Diablo 4, or where you think the story might be going. Anyhow, thank you so much for watching, consider subscribing to my channel for more, and I will catch you in the next video. Peace.